We're very, very, very privileged to have my friend Jerry Brocken speaking to us tonight on... Oh, uh, this Orient Isle, Elizabethan <laughs> and the Islamic world, and the Levant. And he's a very, very distinguished historian, professor of Renaissance studies at Queen Mary College, London. He's written many wonderful books, including The Renaissance Bazaar, From the Silk Road to Michelangelo, uh, The Renaissance, A Very Short Introduction, Great Maps, and the best-selling A History of the World in 12 Maps, which has been translated into 11 languages and I'm sure many more. And he's also a regular broadcaster, critic, and feature writer who has done a three-part television series on maps, powder, plunder, and possession. And of course, the Levant is partly about maps, showing uh, where you are and where you're from. And he's got the, his wonderful book, This Orient Isle, Elizabethan England and the Islamic world, and that is what he's going to be speaking on tonight for about half an hour. And then we have Zainab, born and educated in Istanbul, who will be speaking about the Italians of Istanbul and the properties in particular in the late 19th and early 20th century. So first, welcome, please, Jerry. Thank you, Philip, for that, and thank you for having me. Um, and also to say it's, it's wonderful to be back with Philip. The last time um, we met was actually in a little restaurant um, off the Edgware Road yes. to do a Radio 4 program about Aleppo. Um, and so obviously that has its own certain tragic resonance at the moment. Um, and it's where I'm going to start. I want to really talk to you about the English in the Levant in the later 16th century. Um, so the book I wrote was Elizabethan England, about Elizabethan England in the Islamic world. The title, of course, This Orient Isle, was a deliberate provocation to play on the Shakespearean term, the septed R from Richard II. Um, but it was to say that, in a sense, what I'm sure many of you will know here, but I think for a wider audience, there's a problem about talking about particularly Elizabethan, Tudor England, and its relationship with, let's call it the East, or let's, for this situation, talk about the Levant. The relationship with its encounter with Levantine culture, and particularly its Islamic dimensions. And that's what I really wanted to do with the book. So the book is part history. It's quite a funny thing, because Philip kindly introduced me as a historian, but actually my day job is as a professor of English. So though my title is Professor of Renaissance Studies, I actually teach literature. Um, but all the work I've done up until this point has really been historical, it's been cartographic. But it was always about that exchange between East and West in the Renaissance, in that high European moment, that I think has, ex has excluded and occluded the encounters with the Levant, and particularly its Islamic communities and cultures. So this book was an attempt to address that issue directly around Tudor England, and to say that one of the problems that we have, if we talk about Henry VIII, or we talk about Elizabeth I, or we talk about Shakespeare, we <coughs> don't talk about the fact that hidden in plain view is an encounter and is an exchange with the Eastern Mediterranean, with North Africa, particularly with Protestant England, encountering various varieties of Islam. And you know, the book's subtitle is Elizabethan England and the Islamic World. And that itself, as many of you will know here, is a sort of denigration of the complexities of that cultural world that we call the Levant, and particularly its Islamic cultures. So it's a problem, even using the term Orient, of course, has its own certain political issues and problematics. So what I want to do is really just talk about um, some of the encounters, some of the exchanges. I talk about them in the book, um, and particularly focused on the Levantine uh, area. So I start, and I start with Aleppo, thinking about when Philip and I last spoke. So I want to take you back now to 1530, excuse me, 1553. 1553, in Aleppo, five years before Elizabeth comes to the throne, of course, in 1558. And it's a story that involves this person, which I'm sure many of you will know, of course, is Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who reigns 1520 to 1566. Um, and this is an English portrait, a fantasy of Suleiman. Um, it's painted uh, by uh, an Anglo-Dutch artist. It's in a private collection here in England. 
England. And I'm showing you as a suggestion that here is the English, the Tudors, being fascinated by the power of Suleiman. Suleiman, of course, certainly the most powerful emperor um, at this time in the 1550s, or at best, certainly vying with the Spanish Catholic Habsburg emperor. And so this, of course, is taken from various European engravings, which are in circulation in the 1540s, 1550s. But it is, to some extent, a fantasy, an English fantasy of Suleiman. You can tell that. You look at the, uh, you look at the turban. You look at the horse, which, of course, is coming from a Greco-Roman tradition. It is a sort of admiring fantasy, an Orientalist fantasia, about what the English think Suleiman is like around this time. The person I can't show you is the person I'm going to talk to you about who meets Suleiman in Aleppo in 1553. And he's a man called Anthony Jenkinson. And Anthony Jenkinson is a young textiles merchant um, from Norfolk who is working in Aleppo. Now, of course, he's working in Aleppo because he's a textiles merchant. He's there because, as we know, Aleppo is the terminus of the Silk Road. It's where, if you're interested in Unite like Silk, you need to be. And no surprise, Jenkinson is there in 1553. He sees Suleiman marching through the city. It's kind of extraordinary. You can, you can read the account. Gerald McLean's here, and he knows far more about this than I do. Gerald McLean has, has written The Rise of Oriental Travel. Much of this work is deeply indebted to Mack's work. Um, and so if you need any more advice, or Mac will probably say, by the way, um, so Mac knows a lot about Jenkinson and many of the figures I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, but Jenkinson meets Suleiman because Suleiman is coming through Aleppo from Istanbul, going eastwards, um, to fight the Safavid Persian Empire. This is, of course, a conflict between Sunni and Shia, between the Ottomans and the Persians. And Jenkinson, this little merchant, who I can't show, and of course part of the stories, part of one of the elements of the stories I'm telling, is that these are the, the figures like these textiles merchants, these low-born figures. We have no portraits of these figures. I'm going to talk about the first English ambassador to Istanbul in a minute, um, Harbon, William Harbon. We have no images of him. And it's kind of an interesting moment around the social status of people who are working and living in the, in the Levant around this period. So we have no trace left of Jenkinson. We have the travel narrative that he describes his meeting with Suleiman, and that is rich and interesting enough. So he meets Suleiman, and what's extraordinary is that he somehow, and you know, this is, an, this is not a small thing to gain an audience with Suleiman, which indeed he does, and he establishes the first trading privileges for the English with an Ottoman Sultan in 1553. It's an extraordinary moment. Um, he sees Suleiman coming past, and the, the account is very funny because he says, oh, he's got way lots of linen and silk, and he's a, sort of like a Marks and Spencer's buyer. Because <laughs> he's the textiles merchant, and he's absolutely itemizing everything that he sees the Ottoman uh, janitors as they go past wearing, um, because, of course, that's what he's particularly interested in. He comes back following Elizabeth's succession because he's had that deal with Suleiman. Um, he's chosen to lead the first Muscovy company expedition back through Moscow and actually onto Persia. So we're sort of departing a bit from the Levant, but this is one of the interesting aspects of the stories that I'm telling, that there's a sort of bleeding across the geography. The, the Levant, of course, for the English is absolutely crucial but it's all the different ways in which they can tap into the trade with the East, be it through the Levant or be it through Muscovy. And Muscovy, of course, is something that we don't usually talk about in relation to the Levant, but in fact, the ultimate purpose of the Muscovy uh, company's uh, expeditions was to get to Persia. The other aspect, of course, is that it's a joint stock company. And this is one thing that I've been fascinated by in terms of doing the research, and in the book I talk about the way in which the lack of money that the Elizabethan state, of course, has means that they have to delegate financial and commercial matters to joint stock companies, most of which are working throughout the Mediterranean. Um, the Muscovy Company is one of the first, in fact, is the first. We then, of course, have the Turkey Company, which becomes the Levant Company, and then the Barbary Company as well. The Barbary Company is different because it's not technically a joint stock company. But it's really interesting in terms of how those financial mechanisms are established 
to do the trade, secondarily to also engage in diplomacy with particularly uh, Islamic cultures. And that's primarily what happens with Jenkinson. He goes back, he goes back in 1562, he meets, um, he meets Ivan the Terrible. He then travels down uh, into Kazvin and he meets Shah Tamas in 1562. So I think it's sort of fascinating that he meets uh, Shah, Asar, and a Sultan, it's one of the things I talk about in the book. The sort of sheer range of this small time figure who is working and operating across so many different contexts and managing to survive. He tries and actually fails. The expedition that finally uh, reaches the Persians fails. It only fails because his luck runs out, and for the first time in many, many years, there's been uh, an alliance which has been a peace deal which has been agreed between the Ottomans and the Persians. And so at that point, they're not interested in an alliance with the English. And it is interesting in the accounts that Jenkinson is utterly puzzled by the fact that they don't understand the grandeur of England. And of course they don't. They have absolutely no interest. <laughs> they say, what, you're ruled by a queen? Where is this place? I mean, the accounts are very, very funny. Jenkinson is literally brushed away. Before he disappears and just narrowly escapes with his life, he does, though, in the account, start trying to make an understanding, a very rudimentary understanding, of the difference between Sunni and Shia theological beliefs. This is in 1562, an English merchant trying to understand what those distinctions and differences are, to try and understand the differences and the conflict that's going on between the Ottomans and the Persians. What that leads to, of course, by 1562, we're four years into Elizabeth's reign. And I think that what that leads to, and I talk about this in the book, is the, the to some extent, the relative success of Jenkinson, or the, the understanding of being able to reach out um, outside the remit of Catholic-dominated Europe. This then becomes a story about conflicted religious heritage. Because, of course, Elizabeth, by 1558, is establishing a Protestant state. This immediately, of course, draws the absolute fury of the papacy and also the great Catholic emperor of the day, Charles V, of course, who is then, uh, and then his son, uh, Philip II, subsequently takes over the conflict, which then, of course, defines most of Elizabeth's rule, is with Philip II, uh, the King of Spain. But it's this sudden realization that the absolute isolation of Elizabethan England as a rogue state, and this is very much the language that's used in Catholic fury at the establishment of a Protestant state, is that this is a rogue state. It has to be isolated and it has to be destroyed. Of course, the market of wool collapses in Antwerp around this time, so Elizabeth has no choice but to really reach out um, to the Islamic world. And this is the extraordinary policy decision which is made throughout the 1570s. And it's partly inspired uh, by this moment, by her formal excommunication, Pope Pius V issuing a papal bull, excommunicating Elizabeth as a heretic. And once that moment happens, one of the consequences, of course, is that Elizabeth says, I'm being defined as a heretic. Islamic culture and faith and belief is also defined in this period as a heresy. My enemy's enemy is therefore my friend. <laughs> And rather uh, strategically and rather wonderfully typical of Elizabeth in this very strategic way, she then decides, partly through the help of Walsingham, Francis Walsingham is very much supporting the trade with Turkey, writes a memo in 1577-78 about the need for trade with Turkey. So Elizabeth decides that she can strategically reach out and make that kind of alliance. Because it's fascinating because, oh, do you know I just put in? No. Um, I just put an image that shows sort of Luther wearing a turban. And the way in which in this period, of course, the Catholic propaganda says the two heresies, the twin heresies that we're now dealing with in Europe are Protestantism and Islam. Right? They are seen as theologically, to some extent, complementary. So Elizabeth's response is to say, fine. Because, of course, around this period, there's an official papal edict which forbids you from trading in the Levant with Muslims. That's been there since the 12th century. The, uh, the sentence 
for such trade, and we know of course it's nonsense because the Venetians have been doing it officially and unofficially for centuries, but the official sentence for doing that is excommunication. <laughs> so Elizabeth says, fine, that's okay, I'm there, it's no problem. Um, so what she then does from the late 1570s is start to send out uh, merchants come ambassadors um, to visit the Islamic world. Um, there's already some trade going on um, with modern-day Morocco, with the Barbary states, but by the late 1570s, the key figure who she dispatches is another person, another person who Mac knows all about, uh, but we don't have an image that I can show you, is of William Harbour. William Harbour, this extraordinary man, um, who is another Norfolk-born uh, merchant who is dispatched to Istanbul um, as part of the emergence of the Turkey Company, the, the kind of plot to hatch the Turkey Company, and that he will go out to basically reach out to the Sultan. He will establish, hopefully, commercial privileges um, with the Sultan and absolutely infuriate the Catholics, which indeed he does. Of course, he's established as a Jimmy. He becomes a protected guest. The Ottomans actually welcome him with open arms. Um, and again, you know, we see this the wrong way around because, of course, as many of you will know, in terms of the sort of polyglot, multi-confessional nature of the Ottoman state, a sign of the Sultan's power, unlike with Elizabeth, is actually to embrace all those different beliefs and communities, to embrace Jews, to embrace Protestants, to embrace Lutherans and Calvinists. It's very interesting because they accuse, they, they talk about, they talk about Harborn as the Lutheran ambassador. And he gets really annoyed and he says, I'm a Calvinist, I'm not a Lutheran, excuse me. <laughs> but I think that again is fascinating that you've got these fine distinctions that are at play with Jenkinson talking about the Sunni and the Shia in the 1560s. And you've even got Harborn arguing theological niceties between his Calvinist or his Lutheran beliefs. And the Ottomans are absolutely quite happy to have that discussion. Um, what happens, of course, is the development is in contraband trade. Um, the wool trade is not really taking off. Harbon is not really doing very well on the wool trade. And, of course, what the English can offer is munitions. So arms immediately start to flow to Istanbul. Um, extraordinary moment that what happens is in a wonderful, again, another sly moment of, uh, of theological uh, one-upmanship is that Elizabeth uh, agrees for bell metal from deconsecrated Catholic churches to be sent out to Istanbul in the making of armaments. I mean, she, she used to be chuckling at this moment. Um, and, of course, all the resident Venetian and Spanish merchants and ambassadors in Istanbul are absolutely furious about this. And this is what uh, the uh, Mendoza um, who's the Spanish ambassador, writes to Philip II in 1582. And he says, two years ago, so uh, uh, Harbon arrives uh, 1578, 1579, so he's talking about 1580, he says, two years ago there the English opened up the trade, which they still continue to the Levant, which is extremely profitable to them, as they take great quantities of tin and lead thither, which the Turk buys of them almost for its weight in gold, the tin being vitally necessary for the casting of guns and the lead for purposes of war. Of course, the conflict with Persia is now back underway post the, uh, the peace treaty between the Ottomans and the Persians that I was telling you about with Jenkinson. So this is a good moment in many ways. Harbon just arrives at the right moment. Jenkinson arrives at the wrong moment in Persia. Harbon writes, arrives at just the right moment. It's vitally necessary for the casting of guns and the lead for purposes of war. It is of double importance to the Turk now in consequence of the excommunication proposed ipse facto by the Pope, which I've just shown you, upon any person who provides or sells to infidels such materials as these. The alliance, of course, that is established is between Sultan Murad uh, III and Elizabeth. Um, Fascinating that what starts to happen is the exchange of very cordial letters from 1579. Once Harbon is in place, Elizabeth then starts exchanging letters um, with Murad, which are also not only about establishing commercial alliances, but are also about developing a political and military axis, which is about Protestants and Muslims fighting and in opposition to Catholic Spanish imperial aggression as it is seen by those two in 
the Levant. Um, in 50, and, I, and I show this again, I mean, not to this audience because you understand this, but of course, showing a picture like this of an Ottoman miniature of Murad III, usually to an English audience who's come to hear about Shakespeare and Elizabeth I, is deeply surprising and alienating. Now, maybe to some of you. So I put it up to say, look, this is part of this national story at the moment in the high Elizabethan period. And it's one that we have just completely glided over. Um, Elizabeth writes letters. This is just the sort of honorific. This is the opening address, which just gives you a sense of the way in which she writes to Murad. She says, and it's wonderful because all of it is a lie. She says, Elizabeth, by the grace of the most mighty God, the only creator of heaven and earth, England, okay, France, no, yeah. Ireland, mm, not really, um, <laughs> Queen, and then, of course, this interesting way in which she starts to get going, a very strategic, rather superficial, but nonetheless, an attempt to say, our theological belief is not too dissimilar to your own, because I'm the most invincible and most mighty defender of the Christian faith against all kinds of idolatries. <laughs> by those terrible Catholics <laughs> of all that live among the Christians and falsely profess the name of Christ. Now notice, of course, that she's stepping around any Trinitarian questions here so that there's no issue of the Ottomans yeah. saying, mm, hang on, how, how are we viewing Christ here? So she introduces Christ, but she steps around that issue unto the most imperial, um, sorry, and that, the most invincible prince, Sultan Muran Chan, Murad III, the most mighty ruler of the kingdom of Turkey, Solon of all, the most sovereign monarch of the East Empire, greeting in many happy and fortunate years. From Greenwich, October 1579. Murad responds, and again I show you the kind of standard diplomatic missive which is coming back into London from Istanbul through the Ottoman Chancery. And again, I put that up. I'm sure some of you can do an on the spot translation for me. <laughs> okay. I can't read it. I am, you know, Matt can't read. So my point is, you know, I'm not an Orientalist. I'm not trained in that level of uh, Oriental languages. But these are all the public records office. There are many, many letters like this. And we just simply don't know how to really read them. Now, again, as well as being indebted to Matt's work, I should say that Susan Skillet, extraordinary uh, uh, academic who has died, died in the late 1970s, wrote the definitive book on this and most of my work is just is taken from Skeleton. I recommend if anybody are interested in this moment of the English encounter with the Levant, Susan Skeleton's book on William Harbon and the trade with Turkey is just a most wonderful piece of work. It's done in 1977 by Clarendon Press. Most people just completely ignored it. She died soon after. And now for any of us who do this kind of work, for Matt, for Philip, the kind of scholarship that he's done, everybody returns back to this fabulous work that Skilleter did, translating um, many of these documents. But again, I show you it to sort of talk about the diplomatic exchange and say again, this is not usually seen um, as part of our story. Um, Harborn, of course, is the go-between. He's developing the commercial alliance. He indeed establishes a series of what's called the capitulations. He signs the capitulations, a commercial agreement, which establishes effectively England as a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire. Okay? You know, we're reading this the wrong end of the telescope, right? And the Ottomans saying, fine, whoever you are, fine, okay, we fine, we can absorb that, we can deal with that. This is Elizabeth and Harborn coming as supplicants, right? So not the other way around. Turks always promise, they say, yeah, we'll send you some diplomats. They never do. They're never interested in coming to London. Um, the trade develops accordingly. The capitulations are uh, signed uh, in late 1579, 1580. They are renewed year, uh, uh, rule on rule until 1922. You know why, why they go up until 1922. It's an extraordinary moment that that kind of commercial diplomatic alliance with the Ottomans is renewed right through until 22. Harborn's extraordinary. Harborn appoints English consuls across the Levant. They're in Cairo, Alexandria, Damascus, Tripoli, Jerusalem, and of course, Aleppo. Um, the consequences of that, so of course, what I'm talking up until this point is that this is about rail politic, right? This is very, uh, this is very shrewd diplomacy. This is about political survival on the part of the Elizabethan state. But of course, as we know with those kind of situations, there are human consequences and outcomes that you can never really control. 
And one of them, of course, is this fascinating issue of conversion. And this is, again, I'm totally indebted to Mac for this. Mac uh, uses this in The Rise of Oriental Travel. This um, fabulous figure. This, so you know, is Samson Rowley. A man called Samson Rowley. He's a merchant from Great Yarmouth. He's captured. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> I know. Why would you go back? So he's an infant from Great Yarmouth. I must defend him from Great Yarmouth. Um, he's a merchant from Great Yarmouth. Um, he's traveling uh, in the 1570s in the Levant. He's captured by the Turks in 1577. He's castrated. Look at the way he's sitting. He's converted to Islam. And by the 1580s, he goes under the name of Hassan Aga. Mm. And he is the chief eunuch and treasurer of Algiers under its Ottoman government. And in the late 1570s, Harborn writes to him. I love this exchange, you know, two guys from Great Yarmouth. And Harborn, they're in Hakkut, he writes to him. He, this is, I'm slightly, he basically just say, look, we need to deal with some prisoners that have been taken, some English prisoners in Algiers, you need to spring them, because we have a commercial alliance with you, right? Don't break the cap capitulations. And he sort of says, do you want to come back? And he goes, I'm living in a palace in Algiers, it's now his wife, should I come back? Now, I say that slightly glibly, but again, what we forget at this point, that this form of conversion, forced though it is, is a moment where, pre the Armada sailing, with a tiny, tiny Protestant state that at any moment believes it's going to be overrun, right? With Protestantism in its official form under Elizabeth, still a very, very young religious belief system. Half the country does not believe it. I'd do the same if I was Samson Rowley. And many people who convert, I think, make the same decision. And we have many, many stories of this period. Max told the stories, and Nabil Matar uh, has also done work on this. The converts from Protestantism to Sunni Islam. And of course, it doesn't really happen the other way. There is one account that uh, I come across uh, where this does happen, um, which is kind of interesting, which is in 1586, the English uh, Puritan divines get very excited because there's a, a figure called Chinano the Turk who says that he's going to convert to Protestantism. And there are these pamphlets which are released and everybody gets very excited and says, hooray, this is the beginning of the whole-scale conversion of Islam <laughs> to English Protestantism. Actually, by the way, it doesn't happen. Right? Of course it doesn't happen. But you can see the way in which the fervor around that kind of theological moment of conversion, the sense in which they are not winning, right? And the story of Chinano is very interesting because in the account we're told that he's a sort of inverse version of Samson Rowley. He's uh, taken by uh, the Spanish in the Mediterranean. He's then taken to Colombia. He's in Cartagena in the 1580s when Drake attacks Cartagena he captures prisoners, including Chinano the Turk, brings him back to London, and that's when this guy converts. An extraordinary global story, centered on the Levant, but then goes completely global. Um, and how do we assess the, the kind of veracity of those forms of conversion? We can't, it's absolutely impossible to do so. Natalie Zeman Davis has written about them as well. Uh, the great uh, Marxist feminist historian, Natalie Zeman Davis, wrote a book about Al Wazan, who we've all known as Leo Africanus, the author of the Geographical History of Africa. Um, and she's sort of said, look, let's call this guy by his proper name. If we do the archival research, we know that he's actually from Fez. He's born and named as Al Wazan. Again, the story is that he's trying to travel to Istanbul in the 15 teens, late 15 teens. He's captured by Christian pirates. He's taken to Rome. The Pope, Pope Leo, adopts him and says, we're going to call you Leo the African. Hence his name. His given name is his Christian given name is Leo Africanus. He's baptized, he converts, he does various forms of extraordinary pieces of scholarship in, uh, in the Vatican. And then when, uh, when Rome is torched, uh, the sack of Rome, he leaves. He returns to the Barbary States and he reverts and he disappears. So the veracity, the, how we can sort of understand how these forms of conversion work, we just don't know. We just can't really tell. We have no idea of really assessing it. Um, but what we do know... Yes. ...are the results of some of those exchanges. So we know the way in which the impact of trade with the Islamic world 
is extraordinary throughout this period. I mean, another side of what I do is, is talk a lot about English drama. English drama is replete with stories and with plays about Turks and Moors and Saracens. It's a fashion throughout the 1590s. Everybody's doing plays about Turks and Moors. Um, we also know, of course, that the impact on the trade, on the domestic goods that come into England, is absolutely huge. Um, you think of just the way in which the language changes. So the words, you know this, but you just think about the way in which in this period, if you do etymologies of the terms, you know that in this period, words enter English, which of course have a very different provenance. Sugar, candy, crimson, turquoise, indigo, tulip. They all enter the language at this point in time in the later 16th century. And it's all, of course, as a result of that encounter and that exchange that's going on through the Turkey Company, through the Barbary Company, um, subsequently the Levant Company, and still to some extent um, through the Muscovy Company. Um, this is just, um, I'm just sort of, yes, I'm done, because I'm just going to show you um, a few rows, which are, of course, this is Anthony Shirley, um, who some of you um, may uh, know about, and his, his show off brother. I do, it's not kind of quite clear. That's that Shirley, who, of course, ends up going to Persia um, from 1599 1600 makes a deal with the Persian Shah. And that gives you a sense of the sort of Orientalist fantasy of what's going on. That's his brother, um, Robert. They both end up working as Catholic agents for the Persian Shah Abbas and come back and travel throughout Europe in the early years of the 17th century as English Catholic aristocrats proposing to Catholic states that they make an alliance against the Ottomans. And that's how complicated that kind of exchange between uh, the Levant has actually worked. So I'm just trying you know, to give you a sense of what I've been doing in the work is just to say, you know, the parochialness of how we think about Elizabethan England is utterly profound. <coughs> Mr. knows this, Philip knows this, and this is just an attempt to scratch the surface. I don't do the languages and I don't work in the archives in places like Istanbul, but this just gives you a sense of the fact that we still have so much more to learn about how Englishness is being defined in this great moment of when Englishness we think is being created, Tudor England, which we have completely occluded. We should try and stop doing that. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that tour de force which shows the complexity and proximity of links between England and the Ottoman Empire.